Picking up from the last video, we saw that the slope of the budget constraint is the wage, and that makes the budget constraint a linear relationship that pivots at the 24-hour leisure mark and then rotates up the vertical axis by the wage times 24 hours. This is because if somebody has zero hours of leisure, that means they're working 24 hours. So you can simply take 24 times the wage to get to the vertical intercept. So another way to think about it is if you start at 24 hours of leisure, for every hour of leisure that this person gives up, the income will go up by the wage. Hence the slope is the wage. Once they reach zero hours of leisure, they will get the maximum income possible, which would be 24 hours of work times the wage. In this case, the wage is a dollar. If you look at a model like this, you can quickly derive the wage by taking the vertical intercept and dividing it by 24. For example, this particular budget constraint here we can find the wage by taking $96 and dividing it by 24 hours of work, which would be $4 an hour. The budget constraint is reality. That is, the market is revealing to the worker what their value is. The worker takes that value and then couples it with their indifference curve to make the labor supply decision. Also, simultaneously making the leisure decision. Let's do that in this next slide. Here we've got our original indifference curves and we've partnered that in the model with now the budget constraint. First note that the wage for this individual in the marketplace would be $48 divided by 24 hours of work, which is $2 an hour. These are ridiculous numbers, of course, but they're just used for illustration purposes. So this person has a budget constraint slope of $2 an hour. For every hour of leisure they engage in, they will get negative two in income. They will give up $2 in income. In alternatively, if we go from 24 hours of leisure towards zero, as they move that way, they will be gaining $2 of income until they max out at $48 um, when they're working 24 hours. So there's our budget constraint. Our indifference curves here are threefold. Now, what we learned about the indifference map is an individual will always choose the indifference curve that is furthest away from the origin because higher indifference curves yield higher total utility and people are rationally self-interested and want more utility. I3 would be the indifference curve this person would prefer to get to. However, their budget constraint, reality, prevents them from doing it. In other words, their value in the marketplace, that is the wage they can command, will not allow them to achieve this level of total utility. There is no point on this indifference curve that is available to them. What is available to them is any point on the budget constraint and within the budget constraint. Of course, a rationally self-interested utility maximizer would always choose a point on the budget constraint rather than inside. In other words, if you're going to have two hours of leisure, you would want to get the most income possible. You wouldn't stop short of that. That said, we need to find the indifference curve that would allow us to achieve the highest total utility while still getting us a point on the indifference curve. And you'll notice that that is indifference curve two. And the point is right here at U1. Why is this such an important point? Well, because it allows us to get to the indifference curve that is furthest away from the origin, 
but still touching just barely the budget constraint. This is the highest indifference curve possible while still being on the budget constraint. This is the point that this person will choose. They will choose 16 hours of leisure, which is eight hours of work, and they will choose an income of $16. Eight hours of work times a wage of two is 16. So that's the outcome we're gonna to get to. But to understand why that outcome will emerge, let's imagine they choose a different point on their budget constraint. Now, if they choose B, what does that imply? Well, B is a point where the indifference curve slope is greater than the slope of the budget constraint. Another way of putting that is the marginal rate of substitution is greater than the wage rate. This person is willing to substitute income for leisure at a rate that is greater than what they actually would have to substitute given the wage rate. I'm just going to make up some numbers to kind of highlight this and we'll formalize it a little bit more later. But let's say, for example, that at point B, this person has a marginal rate of substitution of $10, meaning that they're willing to trade off uh, $10 of income for each hour of leisure they get. The slope of the indifference curve is 10. But according to the point B, the wage, which is the slope of the budget constraint, is less than that. So maybe the wage is 8. Well, if this person is willing to trade off $10 to get an hour of leisure, but the market says that they only have to trade off $8, wouldn't they take that deal? Wouldn't they trade off $8 if they're willing to trade off 10 And that means that at point B, there would be an incentive to take more leisure, to move this way. Note that that is getting us closer to what we already know will be the outcome for this individual. Let's now shift to an opposite point on at uh, this down here, A. At this point, the slope of the indifference curve is actually less than the slope of the budget constraint. The other way of putting it is the marginal rate of substitution is less than the wage rate. At this point, let's say this person is willing to trade off $6, that is their marginal rate of substitution, for less leisure. In other words, if you take away an hour of leisure, they would be willing to give up, uh, or they would be willing to do that if they got $6. But the market wage, we already said, is eight. If you give up, if you're willing to give up an hour of leisure for $6 in income and the market will provide you eight, then you will give up an hour of leisure and you will move this way, ultimately getting to you one. What this tells us is at point B, at point A, or any other point on this budget constraint, there is a catalyst for change. There is an incentive to change, either towards more leisure or towards less leisure. So what is going on at U1? And why is this the almost equilibrium outcome where we gravitate towards? Because at this point, the marginal rate of substitution equals the wage rate. At this point, the slope of the indifference curve is the same as the slope of the budget constraint. And there is no incentive to change once you reach that point. Thus, we have an equilibrium outcome. Now let's shift gears and use some actual numbers to hopefully solidify our understanding of this model. Take a look at my um, uh, illustration here. I was going to say my artistic rendering, but I didn't want to be too flattering. Um, so what we've got here is the same axis, but with some more uh, 
numbers to work with and the same thing here we're dealing with dollars so for example uh, we know that the vertical intercept is 48 so we still have uh, a $2 wage in our example and we will use that wage to do the illustration here in the previous uh, verbal renderings I was making up a wage of $10 just for illustration purposes now let's take a look at this indifference curve which we know is not optimal because the optimal one would be the one that's tangent to the budget constraint. So that's going to be here. At this point, I've cut it short just to make it cleaner, but this indifference curve would be where the marginal rate of substitution actually equals the wage. Let's go back to our uh, points uh, A and A and uh, B here, but with numbers. So at this point, we have $34 and uh, seven hours of leisure leaving 17 hours of labor of course 17 hours of labor times two dollars is 34 dollars in income it fits now if we move from seven hours to eight hours of leisure that is from 17 to 16 hours of work then what we're going to find is that the wage is going to cost us two dollars because we're going to get one more hour of leisure lose two dollars that's the slope of the budget constraint but notice that between these points seven and eight we're actually willing to give up according to our indifference curve four dollars we're willing to go from 34 in income down to 30. so the marginal rate of substitution for this extra hour of leisure is four dollars whereas the actual income we would have to give up the wage is only two dollars hence we would want to move this way we were willing to give up four we only have to give up two thus we move towards more leisure this is another way of saying that the marginal rate of substitution between seven hours of leisure and eight hours of leisure is greater than the wage the slope of the budget constraint. So increase in leisure. If in contrast we're down here at 22 hours of leisure and two hours of work, at this point, if we give up an hour of leisure and go towards three hours of work, the increase in income we get is $2. Thus we would go from $4 in income all the way up to six this movement would be two dollars more in income but we're willing to make that move for one dollar notice our uh, indifference curve is allowing us to give up an hour of leisure and do that for one more dollar four to five dollars thus if we're willing to give up an hour of leisure for one dollar and when we actually give up that hour of leisure we get two dollars then we will move towards less leisure and we're moving towards ultimately this point same thing we did in the previous example verbally but now you can see it with some hard numbers the point is that the indifference curve tells us the psychology of the person the trade-offs they're willing to make while maintaining indifference but the budget constraint tells us the actual trade-offs that they have to make. That's the market revealing to them their value, their wage. You put the two together and you understand the decision that will be made.